Romanus I Lycopinus was neither the most nor the least successful usurper, but he was perhaps the most interesting. Romanus, just like any other usurper, sought to replace the ruling dynasty, the Macedonian dynasty, with his own family. And in that regard, he ended up failing after a long period of time. He ended up ruling the Byzantine world for 24 years, and during that time he put crowns on the heads of three of his sons, while also instating another son as the Patriarch of Constantinople. In the end, he was actually displaced by the young man he had originally usurped. How did all of that happen? The tale of Romanus is a complex one, and in this video I hope to unravel it and also to sort of explore what he did as emperor, uh, where he came from, how he got to the point where he could even put himself up as an imperial candidate. Um, Romanus's career is immensely complex, but it's also important and fascinating. So in this video, we're going to look at Romanus and the Byzantine world between 920 and 944. But before we get into Romanus's reign proper, I think that it is only appropriate that we do something of a recap since the politics of the early 10th century are rather complex and it is worth recontextualizing the situation before we delve into too many details. Leo VI, the father of Constantine VII, had struggled throughout his career to sire a male heir who could take his place when he eventually died. To do so, he had to engage in an illegal number of marriages. Finally, he and Zoe Carbonopsina were able to conceive Constantine VII. Unfortunately, Leo died while Constantine was very young, and this meant that Constantine's legitimacy was a real issue. Had Leo lived long enough, he could have put enough of his favorites in positions that Constantine's legitimacy would have not been seriously challenged. As it was, however, he had only really gotten Constantine recognized right before he died, and there were still some people who thought that Constantine's ascension would be something of an aberration and even an offense against religion and decency. For those reasons, but also because Byzantium found itself in a pretty intense war with Simeon of Bulgaria, Constantine and his mother Zoe Carbonopsina were in a tough spot. During this time, um, one of the key contenders for the throne or for influence over the throne was the noble general Leo Phocas. He was the nephew of a far more successful member of the Phocas family who had campaigned in Sicily. He would have possibly become the emperor or the basiliopater had he been a little bit better of a general. However, he suffered some defeats at the hands of the Bulgars and that tended to slow him down some. Meanwhile, he formed a rivalry with an up-and-coming figure in the Byzantine world, Romanus Lycopinus, who had risen to the rank of Drungarius, the admiral-in-chief of the Byzantine navy. It seems that Leo and Zoe Carbonopsina didn't really take Romanus all that seriously since he was peasant-born, and they also seemed to have really underestimated his cunning and initiative. However, Romanus was not to be someone taken lightly, and he managed to seize the palace in 919. Ironically, given that Romanus's entire political career was dedicated to overthrowing the Macedonian dynasty, the only reason why his family was prominent enough to afford him the opportunities that enabled him to become emperor is precisely because Basil I decided to reward his father, Theophylact the Unbearable. During the reign of Basil I, the emperor was in danger of losing his life at the Battle of Tefriki in 872. During that battle, an Armenian peasant named Theophylact saved the emperor's life, 
and was rewarded for his bravery. Theophylact most likely then served in the Imperial Guard, but he was someone who didn't really have any ambitions, and he also was someone who had never acquired an education. He seems to have been perfectly content as an elite soldier of the Emperor and someone who would acquire a good amount of wealth for his services. While his son Romanus could not claim to be noble in any meaningful sense, he did start out with some advantages that have been underestimated by modern scholars. A lot of people assume that Romanus shared his father's lack of education because Constantine VII, a very noble and also very educated man, mocked his educational attainments. But the fact is that Romanus did grow up rich and his father had connections at court. So most likely Romanus was a reasonably well-educated man and he also would have had some connections with senior officials due to his father's fame and his connections in the capital. We don't know the exact date of birth for Romanus, but most likely he was born around the year 870, being very young when his father achieved fame. While he was most likely about two years old at the time that his father saved Basil at Tefriki, most likely Romanus's own self-perception would be that he was the son of a war hero and that had always been the case. While Constantine VII did mock his education and knowledge, as I noted above, Romanus does seem to have received an adequate education. If we look at the course of his career, there are never any indications that he is an ignorant or uninformed person. Early in his life, Romanus decided to enter the Imperial Navy. He married a woman named Theodora and she gave birth to eight children, including two who arrived after Romanus's accession to power in 920. Theodora died in 923, and after her death, Romanus would never remarry. Ludprand of Cremona, one of the better sources for the age of Romanus, says that he was on track for high office due to an early display of heroism against the lion. That could be true, but most likely it's simply because he was the son of a war hero and he displayed some talents of his own which made him stand out. So his service in the Navy was something that was bound to achieve him a command and as we'll see that is how things worked out. Romanus's naval service would pay off by the time he reached his 30s. Sometime after 900 but before 910 Romanus was appointed strategos of the theme of Samos which included most of the western coast of Asia Minor and some of the neighboring islands. This area was strategically crucial since it gave Romanus the chance to defend against piracy and Arab attacks. It was also on the path to Constantinople for an invading fleet coming out of, say, Syria. So this meant that Romanus was on the front lines of defense were there to be a major offensive by sea against the Byzantine Empire. In addition to the strictly military applications of his post, Romanus also was able to gain considerable administrative experience, and this is especially useful since the territory he was governing was not all geographically connected, so his task was a somewhat more complex one. When the previous Drungarius Himerius was disgraced in 912, Romanus was appointed to replace him. And this would be the office that he would need to challenge Leo Phocas and others for preeminence in the state. Now that we have fully established who Romanus is and where he came from, let us return to the recap of the years leading up to 920 and just focus in on the many actions that Romanus had to take between 919 and 920 to come to the throne. During that time, over the course of about a year and a half or so, Romanus seized the palace, had Constantine VII marry his daughter Helena, he defeated and killed Leo Phocas, he sent Zoe Carbonopsina to a convent, he became Caesar, or Junior Emperor, he passed the Thomas Unionus to soft, delegitimized Constantine, 
This basically said that the kind of union which had produced Constantine was illegal and should always be illegal, but that the empire would recognize Constantine as a kind of exception. So basically, Constantine would be allowed to rule, but everybody kind of knew that technically he probably shouldn't be. Romanus also managed to cultivate a friendship with Patriarch Nicholas Mysticus, someone who had initially opposed the marriage and then the legitimation of young uh, Constantine VII. And uh, Romanus had managed to banish people who were supportive of young Constantine, like his tutor Theodore. So by 920, Constantine VII was effectively in the hands of Romanus and had no one else to turn to for advice or help. On September 24th, 920, uh, Romanus completed his usurpation by having Constantine crown him as full emperor while Constantine was just a few months shy of achieving his 15th birthday and the age at which he could rule in his own name. Despite Romanus being named as a co-senior emperor, Constantine remained technically senior even though he never really got to exercise power during this entire period between 920 and 944. Even early on, Romanus quickly gained priority on coins, whereas Constantine faded into the background on the state's official issue. The difference between a usurper and a dynast is that a dynast is capable of passing on the crown to his sons and future successors, whereas a usurper is a one-off ruler. Romanus was determined to go from being a usurper to a fully legitimate emperor whose sons and grandsons would one day rule the Byzantine world. Now, after his face started appearing on coins in lieu of Constantine's, everyone naturally assumed that there would be an announcement that Constantine had mysteriously died because Romanus would put him out of his misery. The other thing is that Constantine was legitimately sickly, so it would be relatively hard to prove foul play. The path was perfect. All Romanus needed to do was eliminate his son-in-law and then he was the only legitimate ruler of the Byzantine world. Yet he didn't do that. Romanus's methods proved to be more subtle, and he tried to more or less soft substitute the rule of the Lecopony for the Macedonian dynasty in a way that he could cloak in legitimacy as much as possible. Constantine VII, for his part, would later claim to have suffered some indignities and insults and to have really hated his father-in-law, but it is clear from Constantine's own complacence during this 24-year period that Romanus was careful not to push him too far and drive him to desperation. Another factor we can't forget is that Constantine and Helena shared a genuine affection and that this prevented Constantine from wanting to take vengeance or engage in revolutionary activity against his father-in-law. So, Constantine was in check, but while Constantine was alive, Romanus couldn't really be a dynast, since there was a living, empowered representative of the dynasty that was currently considered to be the legitimate ruling house of the empire. Romanus came close to completing his consolidation of power, but he missed a very important step and of course, this will come back to haunt him, although it will take 24 years to do so. Rather than demoting or assassinating Constantine VII, Romanus more or less just watered down his prestige by appointing his sons Christopher, who came to the throne in 921 and died in 931, Stephen and Constantine, both of whom came to power in 924 and lasted until 944, or early 945 technically. Um, one quick note about Christopher, he was the man that Romanus really wanted to succeed him, and when Christopher died prematurely, that really threw a wrench in Romanus's succession plans, especially once his other two sons proved to be unworthy of the imperial dignity. Combined with Romanus's successes as emperor, 
This spreading around of imperial power and abstention from harming the heir to a popular and established dynasty further entrenched and legitimized Romanus's own rule. Later on, Romanus was also able to elevate another son, Theophylact, to be emperor, uh, patriarch of Constantinople in 933. While Romanus is mostly known for his usurpation and for his foreign wars, he also attempted to implement some domestic reforms which are worth mentioning. Let's first look at the problem that Romanus seems to have been among the first to recognize, the rise of the Dunatoi. The Byzantine aristocracy, the Dunatoi, or powerful, had been using the relative peace and prosperity of the past century or so to expand their land holdings at the expense of the Byzantine peasantry. How did they do this? Well, unlike peasants who rarely had much of a surplus or reserve, the Dunatoi were not as affected by invasions, raids, droughts, etc., and they could effectively profit from crisis. So when a crisis like this would occur, a peasant farmer might be ruined and need to get money in a hurry to feed his family. Well, a Dunatus could then offer that peasant money in exchange for his land. So this led many peasants to sell their lands in a desperate bid to save their family in the short term. What this means is that the Dunatoi are rising in terms of relative prestige to the state itself, that they are undermining the land basis of the theme system for providing manpower, and that they are potentially creating a disenfranchised and potentially subversive or dangerous crowd of peasants who feel like they have been cheated in some way. So the Dunatoi were a potentially serious threat to the stability of the empire, and it looks like Romanus is the first to pick up on that and to therefore champion the cause of the Byzantine peasantry. Romanus seems to have understood the problem of peasants being displaced by selling their land and the problem presented by the rise of the Dunatoi, but his solution for all of this was rather tepid and inadequate. His solution, which he began to implement as early as 922, was the system of protimesis or priority to regulate who could stake a claim to peasant land when it was put on the market. Peasants had to first offer their land to a relative or neighbor before they could start fielding offers from the wealthy. This law was reissued many times, so it clearly was not well enforced, and as Byzantinist Tim Gregory observed, it did not address the underlying issues of why peasants were putting their land on the auction block in the first place and why they were only able to sell to rich people i.e. Romanus does not seem to have understood that peasants were poor and that they were disproportionately affected by things like raids, droughts, and invasions. So um, this was an inadequate solution, but it did kind of lay the groundwork for future emperors like Basil II to engage in more broad sweeping reform which would defend peasants from the encroachments of the Dunatoi. When he first came to power, Romanus found himself in the middle of a pretty bitter struggle with Simeon of Bulgaria. Simeon at this time was pressing hard into Byzantine holdings in the Balkans and was trying to capture or at least badly damage Constantinople, making several attempts on the city in Romanus's early reign. Romanus tried to make peace with Simeon, offering to pay tribute to end the war, but he would not accept Simeon's demand to be recognized as an equal and a fellow emperor. Militarily at a disadvantage, Romanus sought to avoid direct confrontations and to use diplomacy to keep Simeon at bay. It's not clear if Romanus had any real grand strategy for defeating Simeon, or if he was just searching for small openings here and there and hoping that an opportunity would present itself 
where he could finally rid himself of the threat of Bulgaria. My guess is that he didn't really have a plan and that he was just looking for openings as they might present themselves. The first three or four years of Romanus's reign were arguably among the worst of his time on the throne. All of his efforts to slow down or stop Simeon and the Bulgars went poorly during this period. In 919, just as Romanus was trying to establish his authority in Constantinople, Simeon was at the city's gates. In 921, Simeon actually occupied the suburb of Caserti near the land walls. On the European shore of the Bosphorus in 922, the Byzantines suffered an embarrassing defeat and Simeon then proceeded to sack Stenum and burn one of Romanus's favorite palaces. In 923, Simeon took Adrianople after a tough siege and then tortured to death the governor, Moralian, for putting up such a fight. So, while perhaps the remaining Byzantine forces were inspired by the conduct of the garrison of Adrianople, Romanus had lost a capable subordinate in Moralian, so this was not much of a moral victory if it was won at all. Despite all of these victories by Simeon, the fact remained that he couldn't compel Romanus to do all that much because he couldn't take Constantinople. It was simply too great of a fortress for him to take without the assistance of a great fleet. Therefore, Simeon resolved to make a land air assault in 924 with the aid of the Fatimid fleet from Egypt. However, unfortunately for Simeon's grand assault, it never materialized. As the envoys were on their way back to Bulgaria, Romanus managed to intercept them and break up the plan that Simeon had been trying to form. He won over the Arab envoys with presents and the promise of an annual tribute, something that was more tangible than the vague promises that Simeon had offered to these same men earlier. When Simeon arrived at Constantinople, he was dismayed by the lack of a Fatimid fleet and he requested a meeting with Romanus knowing that he would not be able to take the city by either assault or siege without the fleet that he had intended to have for this campaign. Due to the intercession of the aging patriarch Nicholas Mysticus, there was an actual face-to-face -face meeting between Romanus and Simeon. The two rulers would meet on a specially constructed pier at the northern end of the Golden Horn, and before they met, both of them exchanged a large number of hostages in order to ensure their mutual good behavior. Perhaps Simeon was aware of the kind of tricks that previous emperors had tried to play on unsuspecting foreign rulers who met to parlay in this way. When they met, Romanus lectured Simeon on Christian morals, um, as we'll see, Romanus was very religious, and most likely he was not just doing grandstanding to try to gain some kind of political upper hand, but he thought that he was really speaking truth to power in some way. However, despite Romanus's high-flung rhetoric, he did agree to pay a large tribute, including 100 silk robes, in exchange for Simeon vacating his Black Sea forts. During the parley, two eagles circled, one over Thrace and one over Constantinople. The people who interpreted signs from the gods, or at least from the heavens, decided that the two eagles circling around represented that it was destiny for there to be two empires in the Balkans. However accurate this reading of the flight of two different eagles turned out to be, the fact remains that Simeon never again invaded Byzantine territory. However, there was no way for Romanus to know that Simeon wouldn't be back, and for the next couple of years he had to keep his primary focus on Europe. 
During this time, it was obvious that Simeon wanted to provoke Romanus into renewing the conflict and that he hoped to win fresh victories at the expense of the Byzantines. Romanus, for his part, doesn't want to be provoked and led into a war that he doesn't think he'll win. In 925, contrary to what they had just agreed upon, Simeon declared himself Basileus of both the Romans and the Bulgars. Previously, he had been content to try to get his rival to recognize that he was the Basileus of the Bulgars, and now he's expanded his reach to claim that he also rules over the Roman people. Romanus, for his part, joked that if Simeon were so inclined, he could also call himself the Caliph of Baghdad. It would make no real difference, since he clearly was not that. The next year, still hoping to bait Romanus into a war that might not favor him, Simeon declared the independence of the Bulgarian church. Romanus's government actually did not respond to this claim as they thought that responding would in some way legitimate or reward Simeon for his actions. If you've watched my previous couple of videos, you realize that Simeon was one of the most formidable enemies that Byzantium ever faced and that he had been a problem for Leo, Alexander, and the Council of Regency before Romanus had taken over. So it's worth looking at how Simeon met his end. After failing to provoke Romanus and the Byzantines, Simeon managed to get himself bogged down with wars in the Western Balkans. After putting down the Serbs, Simeon sent one of his generals against the nascent kingdom of Croatia. At this time, Croatia was a Byzantine ally ruled by King Tomislav. Tomislav was able to win a great victory in 926 and even to force an unfavorable peace upon Simeon, who then died early the next year, 927, at the age of 69. Simeon had proven himself to be one of, if not the greatest rulers that Bulgaria would ever produce. and. Aside from his late career defeat in Croatia, he had been quite successful and could even claim to have been one of the best rulers of his entire period, full stop. But our story is not about Simeon, it's about Romanus. From a Byzantine perspective, the most significant thing about the death of Simeon of Bulgaria is that it enabled peace to break out between Byzantium and Bulgaria and would eventually allow Romanus to shift his focus elsewhere. Simeon's successor was a son by his second marriage named Peter, who was still a minor at this time. Peter's government wanted to make a permanent settlement with Byzantium and to avoid any more protracted and expensive wars. To achieve this, the two sides decided to make a marriage alliance between the ruling families of each empire. Peter was married to Christopher Lycopinus' daughter Maria at Mesembria in a ceremony run by the new patriarch Stephen II. Now, our sources for the most part were overwhelmed with the grandeur and splendor of this wedding and they seem to have kind of ignored some of the other points of significance about it. This was, however, the first time that a Byzantine ruler had married outside of the empire, and because of this it was celebrated greatly. Or I should say a foreign ruler had married a Byzantine princess, since Peter was in fact a Bulgarian and not a Byzantine ruler. There appears to have been some form of tribute that Byzantium agreed to pay to Bulgaria, but it is quite possible that this was just an income for the new Empress Maria Irene and her upkeep. Peter, whom Romanus insisted on calling the Archon of Bulgaria, Archon is just a Greek word for a leader. It's fairly generic and nondescriptive ruled peacefully for 42 years. Once Peter is gone, then old patterns of behavior between uh, Byzantium and Bulgaria will break out, 
meaning that they will go to war with one another. But for the next 42 years, Romanus and his immediate successors will have peace and they will be able to use that peace to do other things. Shortly after being rid of his empire's long-term rival, Romanus found himself facing a kind of natural crisis in the capital at Constantinople. The winter of 928 was especially brutal, and our sources claim that it was the longest and coldest in the history of Constantinople. During this winter, and in line with his reputation as a gentle ruler who despised bloodshed and unnecessary suffering, Romanus personally directed the emergency food supply to make sure that his citizens were able to eat and survive the winter. So when people say that Romanus was a gentle usurper, they don't just mean that he was kind to the people in power, but that he also had some kind of compassion and much more of a heart than most rulers in the medieval period. After 927, Romanus was free to shift his attention to the east, where there were greater opportunities than there were in the Balkans. Now, while he was dealing with the threat of Simeon, Romanus had actually created a truce with the Caliph in Baghdad in 924, knowing that he didn't have the resources to spare on the east and wanting to free up troops for operations in the west. After he made Peter his son-in-law and gained an ally rather than an enemy on the imperial throne of Bulgaria, Romanus was free to shift his attention back to the east where there were greater opportunities. Byzantine armies had generally held the initiative since at least the time of Leo VI, if not before, and for Romanus and his contemporaries, Leo's action in annexing the province of Mesopotamia was an inspiration and a model. That action had marked the first real major frontier adjustment in about 200 years, where Leo had outright annexed an entire theme at the expense of his foreign foes. So, for Romanus and others, they would like to emulate that and do it again. After 926, Romanus would be directing the empire's resources to eastern expansion, and he would be aided in this by the very division among the various Muslim powers. There were a number of emirates in the region which were more or less independent. Nominally, all of them were subordinate to the Abbasid Caliph in Baghdad, but in reality, most of them were operating independently and did little more than pay lip service and occasional tribute to the Caliph. Despite acquiring his reputation on the basis of his physical bravery and rising to prominence as a military commander, Romanus rarely served in the field after he became emperor. In fact, it's quite probable that he never really commanded an army once he assumed the crown. Perhaps he just had too many potential enemies in Constantinople, such as the young Constantine VII, who was by this point a man and could potentially cause problems if he were so minded. Because of that, and possibly just because he didn't want to command armies for whatever reason, Romanus turned to his friends. One of his best friends and longest serving allies was John Kirkowas. He had been instrumental in rounding up a lot of the potential subversives in Constantinople when Romanus first took power. By 923, Kirkowas was serving in a command in the east. That year, he was able to finish off Leo of Tripoli who had been the commander who had destroyed Thessalonica back in 904. Leo of Tripoli, just to recap, was actually a Greek who had been captured at some point by Arab forces. He had converted to Islam, and he had essentially been a successful pirate for many years. Kirkowas finally wiped him out, and in so doing, he instantly became a hero. Kirkowas spent six years consolidating the Byzantine hold in Armenia, culminating in the capture of Manzikert in 932. By this point, of course, Romanus had directed most of his resources east, whereas Kirkowas's earlier accomplishment was done with a partial army, since Romanus had the bulk of his resources in the west. So now Kirkowas has a free hand and 
many troops to work with. His greatest achievement during his Armenian campaign was, as I mentioned, the capture of the city of Manzikert in 932. That city has some other, I guess, meanings in Byzantine history, but those meanings are all in the future. And for now, the capture of Manzikert will sound like a pretty great achievement. This gave the empire control of the north shore of Lake Van and control of the routes into central Armenia and beyond. So what this did was effectively give the Byzantines much more control over the Armenians and more routes they could take to raid and attack their enemies, while also depriving their enemies of routes to invade Byzantine territory. So while this is not a spectacular gain, it's still pretty worthwhile, and it's something that will have some positive consequences down the line. Two years after capturing Manzikert, Kirkawas focused his attention further south in the region of Melitene. On May 19, 934, his forces completed the conquest of the Emirate of Melitene. To consolidate this gain, colonists of Greek and Armenian origin were rushed into the area in order to make sure that there were loyal subjects to garrison and defend this region. While, as I mentioned earlier, there had been previous times where Byzantine forces had captured different areas from various Arab emirates, this was the first time that Byzantium had actually just attacked and conquered an entire Arab emirate. So this does show that Byzantium as a whole was growing in strength relative to its enemies and that Byzantium had found a new great general in John Kirkawas. In fact, it was probably around this time that people began to whisper that Kirkawas was a latter-day Belisarius. The conquest of Melitene was a great victory for Byzantium, no two ways about it. However, it did have the effect of creating some degree of unity and cohesion on the other side that had not existed before. After the fall of Melitene, a new leader on the Islamic world would emerge, and he would prove to be far more capable and organized than most of the people whom the Byzantines have been fighting in the recent past. He was the Emir of Mosul, his name was Saif al Dawla, and he is known as the Sword of the Dynasty. He would prove quickly to be about equal to Kirkawas as a general, and the two men would find themselves locked in a battle that neither could win. For the next six or so years, the two men traded blows back and forth without any real successes on either side. However, in the year 940, something happened when both men happened to be recalled to their respective capitals because of more serious crises. Um, the Caliph of Baghdad called for Saif to come there and help him deal with a crisis further east. And while Baghdad's authority was typically not respected that much, in this case, he managed to get the best general in the Islamic world at that time to come. For um, Kirkawas, there was another threat at Constantinople and Romanus was recalling him, but we'll get to that in a moment. Kirkawas, for his part, would be away from the east from 940 to 942 whereas Saif's absence would extend until at least 945. The crisis which drew Kirkawas away from the eastern frontier is known as the Rus byzantine War of 941. Earlier in the time of Leo VI, there had also been a conflict with the Rus, but they had been relatively quiet for the last 30 years. Now, Grand Prince Igor of Kiev sailed with a thousand ships, that number is from Ludprand of Cremona, someone in Italy who had a lot of knowledge about diplomacy and had spent time in Constantinople. He was also the stepson of an ambassador who happened to be present in 941. His number is most likely accurate, or at least within the ballpark. There are Greek sources which actually claim that there were 10 to 15,000 ships that were with Igor but that is literally impossible based on the production abilities of the period, uh, logistics, the availability of manpower. I mean, a whole lot of things prevent 10 to 15,000 ships from being possible. Um, 
not to mention that it would be impossible to control that size of a force. Um, mo if you literally did raise 10,000 ships in the medieval world, you were condemning the vast majority of the men on those ships to death due to logistical issues, the impossibility of anchoring that many ships during a storm, etc., etc. But let's not get too sidetracked. Whatever the actual number, we'll go with a thousand. Romanus knew the severity of the crisis, and therefore he decided to recall his fleets. Bardos Phocas, the brother of Leo Phocas and one of his other major commanders, and John Kirkawas. So at that time, Romanus had been pressing forward offensives all over the place, but he knew that he had to defend his capital. Perhaps Igor had learned of the location of the Byzantine forces and thought that he could sail along the Black Sea and strike before Romanus would be ready. For his own part, the emperor readied some old ships. He took 15 retired vessels, hurriedly patched them up, and then equipped them with Greek fire. The good thing about Greek fire, of course, is that when you're fighting wooden ships, something that can cause ships to catch on fire could be a game changer and a force multiplier. Now, what Romanus supposedly did was pretty clever. He instructed his commander to sell out to meet the, the Rus vessels. And because he despised the small number of vessels and he could tell they were older and kind of beaten up, Igor just thought he would surround and capture these vessels, take the crew's prisoner and learn about um, Romanus's plans and what he could expect in terms of city defenses. But instead, he got Greek fire. So this destroyed a number of Igor's vessels. It hardly crippled his fleet, but it probably was pretty demoralizing and embarrassing while also providing a bit of a moral boost to the Byzantines. Greek fire, of course, was still a wonder weapon, and it was something that would have, uh, you know, made Igor a little more cautious and bought some time for the rest of the Byzantine forces to arrive. Following the Greek fire incident, Igor decided to focus his efforts on Bithynia, a relatively prosperous area to the east of Constantinople on the Asian side of the Bosporus. He was getting a lot of plunder from this area when Bardas Phokas and his army arrived and contained the threat. Igor was occupied by Bardas and he was struggling for control of the region and trying to continue gaining plunder. We are told by our sources, who are admittedly highly biased, that the depredations of the Rus were brutal and almost unspeakably horrible, even when compared to depredations they had faced at the hands of other foes in the past. Feelings running high. Now, while Igor is fighting in Bithynia, Kirkawas' army also arrives, and Theophanes, who is now the main fleet commander, arrives with the bulk of the Byzantine navy. Igor realized too late that he had been trapped by these two armies in the fleet, so what he tries to do is break out before all is lost. However, Theophanes happened to have even more Greek fire, and once again the Byzantines will inflict a frightful toll on Igor's navy. While the first naval battle near Constantinople was probably not really that devastating, just more demoralizing, this one was. We don't know the exact casualty figures, but supposedly very few Rus were able to escape. And while there were many who were taken prisoner, most of them were not granted quarter, but instead were slain on the spot for the rape, pillage, and plunder that they had been inflicting on Bithynia for the past several months. With the threat of the Rus temporarily dealt with, Romanus was able to dispatch his main field armies and fleets back to their respective campaigns. John Kirkawas arrived back in the east in early 942, quickly striking at the city of Aleppo and managing to carry off 10 to 15,000 prisoners. While he did not actually capture Aleppo, this was still a major victory as this would have given him quite a lot of campaign funding since he sold these prisoners or ransomed them back. In the fall of that same year, Edessa offered Kirkawas a holy relic in exchange for their safety. So um, Kirkawas thought that was a pretty fair deal and he left them to their own devices while they negotiated this agreement with the Caliph as the 
leader of the faith of Islam. The caliph was the person who would have to approve of such a transaction. So this would take a while, but Kirkawas was confident that he would continue to win battles around Edessa and hold them to this bargain. While the negotiations were going on between the citizens of Edessa and the caliph, Kirkawas continued to campaign in that region. Over the next year and a half, he managed to capture the key city of Dara and some other places that the Byzantines had not held since 641 during the initial Islamic invasions of the region back when Heraclius had been emperor. The holy relic that the Edessans possessed was the Mandilion of Christ. This is supposedly a rag on which he wiped his face and left an impression of it. In the spring of 944, Edessa finally handed over the Mandilion to Kirkawas, who then forwarded the object to Constantinople for official consecration. When it arrived for its enshrinement at the Hagia Sophia, Romanus was too ill to attend the ceremony, so the emperors who attended it instead were his two surviving imperial sons and Constantine VII. Now, as I mentioned earlier, his two sons who survived after Christopher's death were not necessarily of the highest quality. However, Constantine VII was a scholar in his own right and someone who would fully appreciate the importance of such a relic. The following story most likely owes a lot to propaganda that Constantine VII himself wrote down at some point or ordered someone else to write down. However this story came to us, the story goes that when the Mandilion was presented to the three emperors, the two Lecopini were not able to see Christ's face because they were not sufficiently learn, learned or pious. However, Constantine was able to see the face because he was the rightful ruler. Someone in the audience apparently noticed that two of the emperors could not see the face of Christ, but that the rightful heir to the throne could, and that led him to shout for Constantine to claim his birthright. Now, the story, given its timing and the fact that someone is calling for Constantine to become emperor in his own right without his father-in-law or brothers-in-law, is a little too close for coincidence, a little too on the nose, but it does make for an interesting story. Shortly following the return of the Mandilion to Constantinople, Romanus received word that Igor was coming back with another large fleet looking for revenge and plunder. However, the aging Romanus I Lycopinus decided in one of his final imperial acts of note to instead make peace. He figured that it would be cheaper to grant concessions to the Rus than to fight them on a large scale again and possibly risk having them lay waste to one of his prosperous themes. So he sent ambassadors to meet with the Grand Prince on the Danube and buy him off by granting trade concessions, visitation rights to Constantinople for the Rus, extradition arrangements for fugitives, escaped slave laws and other mostly minor things that were far better than having to fight the Rus in another pitched battle. Romanus by this point was perhaps wise enough to realize that while he had won heavily the last time, when you're fighting on a large scale like that, the outcome was never all that predictable and there's a lot of risk involved. So he thought that this was a low risk, high reward strategy. Around the same time, the Pechenegs were about to raid Byzantine territory, and Romanus decided once again to use diplomacy rather than force. Instead of fighting them off, he simply offered them a bribe if they would redirect their raid against Bulgaria instead of Byzantium. His grandson-in-law, Peter of Bulgaria, was no doubt not happy with Romanus's diplomacy in that regard, but Romanus had saved the Byzantines from a lot of unnecessary trouble, and this allowed his generals to continue to do their good work on the frontier, rather than having to rush back to fend off a threat at the capital. While Romanus's actions in dealing with Igor's return in 944 show that he was still fairly sharp and certainly rational, he did experience quite a bit of decline in his later years, 
and much of that decline was not so much a drop-off in his intellectual capacity as simply a drop-off in his spirits and his ability to stay focused on this world and this life. In his last years on the throne and in the years following, spoiler alert, he does have a post-imperial career, Romanus was increasingly preoccupied with the fate of his immortal soul, spending a disproportionate amount of his time in private meetings with monks discussing his immortal soul. By this point, I'm sure that Romanus's primary source of depression was that his planned Lycopony dynasty was not going to happen. His oldest, favorite, and most capable son, Christopher, had died young in 931, and his two other sons, Stephen and Constantine, had proven to be unworthy of the imperial dignity. Romanus, as someone who seems to have genuinely cared about the well-being of the empire and doing what was right for the public, we've seen that in some of his previous actions, such as when he directed the food supply back in 928, knew that he owed it to the people of Byzantium to give them an emperor who was worthy of the office. And the person who was the most worthy was his son-in-law, the man he had deposed in the first place, Constantine the Seventh. So, as he realized that, he realized that his dynasty wasn't going to happen and that he had been merely a caretaker who had inserted some of his genetics via his daughter. That wasn't a mean accomplishment, but if you had been a sitting emperor for 24 years and you knew that your legacy would just be as the father-in-law of an emperor, ultimately, that's pretty depressing. According to the sources, Romanus was also feeling a great deal of guilt about his usurpation of Constantine's throne. Personally, I'm very doubtful that he had guilt about that, um, unless it was because of how he had failed to provide an heir who was superior to Constantine. I seriously doubt that he was now having a lot of reservations about his initial plan, merely the way that it had turned out. I'm sure that Constantine himself probably inserted that little part in to show that Romanus actually wasn't that great of a guy and that he, Constantine, should have been in charge the whole time. But whatever the reason and whatever his precise uh, source of anxiety and source of depression, it's clear that Romanus was not a happy man in his later years and that he was brooding and deeply distressed about the fate of his immortal soul. It seems that, for whatever reason, Romanus thought that the end was nigh for him in 944. As I mentioned earlier, he was too ill to attend the return of the Mandilian to the Hagia Sophia. So perhaps he thought that the illness was more serious than it was at that time, and this led him to call for a wave of new legislation. He thought that if he passed the right laws, that this could sort of give him a better chance of saving his soul. He decided to remit all government rents in the capital and cancel all debts. That wasn't necessarily good for the public treasury, but it did gain him some popularity, as well as uh, you know showing his charity for the needy. He decreed that every Jew and Armenian in the capital had to either convert to orthodoxy immediately or face expulsion. Um, it was fairly common for people to be persecuted on religious grounds in the ancient and medieval worlds, and in the case of Romanus's sort of limited persecution here, it was a very selfish one. He apparently had not been bothered by religious diversity before this, but he thought that if he just stood up hard enough for the church at the expense of thousands and thousands of people, that this would help his soul. So it was a purely selfish move, and I'm sure that the lives of thousands of people were ruined because they had to relocate from the capital to some other place where they didn't have the same means to make a livelihood. The biggest announcement that he made, though, in terms of its long-term impact, was when he publicly announced that when he died, his primary successor would be not his two sons, but rather his son-in-law, Constantine VII, Porphyrogenitus. And because he had announced that in public, his sons were aware that they were not going to inherit the empire. 
So you can imagine that their response was not a positive one and this would create yet more problems. The two Lacopony brothers, Stephen and Constantine, decided to mount a coup against their father in order to save their own positions from their brother-in-law, Constantine. Their coup was insufficient, but it was a little bit on the bold side. It was incompetent, but yet it had a certain amount of energy to it. I suppose you could compare it to the Bay of Pigs over a thousand years later. At any rate, this coup would last for a couple of weeks. The two Lacopony brothers arrested and deposed their father, sending him off to a monastery on the prince's islands. At this time, they also tried to arrest Constantine VII, but there was public support for him, and a crowd gathered outside of the palace and demanded to see him to make sure that he was safe. He waved to the crowd. That sort of deterred uh, the crowd from storming the palace. And then the two brothers realized that killing Constantine would not be an option. So they were kind of in charge now, but they also had a third partner they didn't want. And it was just not a comfortable situation. They didn't know how to resolve it. Ultimately, it would be another Lacopony family member who would break the stalemate. Helena, their sister, who was also Constantine the Seventh's wife, eventually convinced her husband that he was the rightful heir and that the public was on his side. So Constantine finally sent out orders to arrest and depose his two brother-in-laws. They were then sent to join their father, Romanus, at the monastery. When they arrived, Romanus taunted them with a Bible verse about disobedient sons. By this point, he had become even more religious and even more focused on his soul's fate. Given the increasingly morbid interest of Romanus, perhaps it was for the best that he was deposed from his office and given more time to concentrate on what death would bring for him. Now he was freed from any official responsibilities and could spend all of his time thinking about and talking about his soul and his sins. In 946, Romanus wrote down all of his sins and then sent the book off to some monks living at Mount Olympus to fast for two weeks and pray for his soul. Supposedly, the monks heard a voice from heaven saying that the prayer was granted, and then when they opened up the book, they found that all of the pages had gone blank. So, according to the monks who were friends with Romanus, his sins had all been forgiven, and he would not, in fact, suffer eternal damnation for his acts of usurpation. I suppose that must have been something of a relief to him, but since he had been worrying about this for so long, I imagine that he was still a bit skeptical and probably continued to do more penance for the next couple of years. Whatever Romanus's intentions with regard to his retirement, it does appear that there were still some Lecapini supporters out there who wanted to restore him the power. Keep in mind, he had ruled for 24 years, and he had gained some allies during that time. Not everyone was a Constantine VII fan. Theophanes, the High Admiral, and Patriarch Theophylact were actually caught in the act of trying to organize a plot to restore Romanus to the throne. Theophanes was not related to Romanus, but had been appointed by him, and since he occupied a position that Romanus had once occupied the position of Drungarius, they might have been close. Patriarch Theophylact was, of course, a son of Romanus, so his desire to see his father return to power requires no real comment. At any rate, though, they were caught early on in this plot, and it never amounted to much, just like the short-lived corporate plot against the FDR early in his administration. Romanus's awareness or approval of this endeavor is unclear. He may not have been aware, and he might not have even approved of it had he known. At any rate, though, Theophylact was forgiven and retained as patriarch for the rest of his life, whereas Theophanes was less lucky. He was just disgraced and then dismissed from office, but surprisingly not executed. On June 15, 948, Romanus I Lycopinus finally died at around the age of 78, 
and he was interred next to his wife in Constantinople. To be a truly great emperor, one has to be transformative in a way that's positive for one's empire. In that sense, Romanus falls short of greatness. However, he doesn't fall all that short of greatness. As an emperor, he inherited an empire that was prosperous and expanding, and he managed to keep that going. That has to count for something. On the most basic level, Romanus I Lycopinus was a successful emperor who managed to leave a genetic trace on the Macedonian dynasty. He failed as a usurper to establish his own dynasty, the Lycopini, but that was not a loss for the empire as a whole, and his usurpation was not an interruption. In fact, his usurpation helped to shore up the state and gave Byzantium an experienced, wise, and capable ruler at a time when it was threatened by Simeon of Bulgaria. His land reforms were a tepid first step to the protections that other 10th century rulers would implement against the Dunatoi and their rising power. Had he taken more proactive steps or dealt with the problem in a way that was more institutional, perhaps he could have been a great emperor. He ushered in an age of peace in the Balkans once Simeon was dead and he created an ally out of Simeon's successor, Peter, and his generals under his direction were able to gain some impressive victories in the east and add territory, at, especially at Melitene. Almost all of the negative press that he has received over the centuries is due to the influence of Constantine VII, who was a prolific writer and who bore a serious grudge against his father-in-law, especially for the Thomas Unionists and taking away 24 years of Constantine's time on the throne. That being said, once Constantine came to power, he could have changed anything that he thought was truly objectionable about Romanus's reign. For the most part, other than some shifts in personnel, Constantine VII must have approved the way that Romanus ran the empire, since he actually, as we'll see, changed very little. While he might not have been a scholar, and he might not have had the most fancy education of his day, Romanus was still an intelligent, thoughtful, and highly successful and effective emperor. So, although he's a usurper, he still deserves quite a bit of respect, and of all the usurpers in history, as I commented at the outset of this video, he is both the most and least successful. 